Hello and welcome everybody to another episode of the New Discourses podcast. I'm James Lindsay, and today we're going to talk about democracy. Uh, more specifically, more broadly, I think most of you will be very familiar at this point, especially if you're regular readers or in people who engage with, with, with New Discourses materials, whether it's a podcast or my written work. You'll be very familiar, or if you just experience these ideologies like critical race theory or critical theories more broadly or critical social justice or whatever we want to name all of the various branches, I think you'll be very familiar with the idea that they abuse language, that they tend to mean more than one thing by words, though they trade off the public's expectation that words mean what they usually mean while they have some specialized meaning. And so there are a variety of tricks that they use in conjunction with that where they kind of mean two things at once. You know, we could talk kind of humorously about Schrodinger's superposition of words or you know, meanings of words or whatever and they're trading off of this equivocation so you know they might stand up in front of a crowd and in this case we, we're talking about democracy so they might say that you know we need more democracy and you might think well yeah well maybe and then you might have a little tick in your brain this is wait we're a republic and the greeks warned about too much democracy but generally speaking okay this is this is the thing that americans are very easily sucked in on democracy and of course if you remember the testimony from dr bella dodd uh the defected communist party usa leader who spoke to the house committee on american activities in 1953 you can read her testimony i highly encourage that you go look it up and it's on the internet for free and read that testimony, one of the things that she says is that when communism comes to America, it will come in terms that Americans find pleasing or pleasant. So democracy could be definitely one of these. Well, it turns out that democracy is one of these double meaning terms. And it's very difficult to tell, you know, if say some member of the Democratic Party gets up and stands and has a speech and they say, you know, the Republicans are threatening our democracy or uh, you know, challenging critical race theory threatens our democracy or something like this. You have to start to wonder a little bit once you understand that democracy has more than one meaning. And so to just kind of dive into this right from the beginning, I've been reading a lot of the critical pedagogy literature. I mean, people are asking me all the time, you've done a lot on critical race theory. Will you talk about queer theory? Will you talk about Franz Fanon? Will you talk about uh, critical pedagogy, the critical theory of education, or the application of the critical of critical theory to education, and you know it's a lot of things to have to like take on while keeping up with digging into my roots about Hegel and Marx, and while also trying to continue to speak about and meet people and discuss and strategize around critical race theory. It's a lot to do. But that said, I've been reading critical pedagogy recently, and there's this book called On Critical Pedagogy by Henry Giroux, who you probably don't know, you probably never heard of, but Henry Giroux probably bears more responsibility for screwing up America and the Western world than most people do. Henry Giroux is a radical critical pedagogy activist. In fact, he's considered the father of critical pedagogy, even though a much more famous name, Paulo Freire, with the pedagogy of the oppressed, is considered his inspiration and sometimes is named as the father of critical pedagogy. It's really Giroux who invented the idea of dragging critical theory into this. So the reason is that Freire is mostly a Marxist. And in fact, he's kind of bent toward Leninism even. Whereas Giroux was already this kind of radical education activist and educator, and he was very intimately familiar with people like Herbert Marcuse. He was a member of the New Left, and his writing is just thoroughly infused with critical theory and Marcusean, and even very familiar with Derrida, so postmodern thought. And Giroux is actually an adept master of both critical theory and postmodernism. And so he is frustrated. We don't have to get into the whole story right now because it's beside the point. And Giroux ends up reading the pedagogy of the oppressed. He stumbles upon the pedagogy, pedagogy of the oppressed in a particularly frustrated time, reads the whole thing in one night, falls in love with Ferrari's basically Marxist account of how to do education, which quotes Lenin and Mao and lionizes Che Guevara, speaks positively about Castro and all of this nonsense, and he thinks this is it, this is the thing. And so the point of all of that is that Giroux is a big figure in critical pedagogy. He is one of a handful of the guys. You should read Freire, of course, if you want to know what's going on in critical pedagogy, but Henry Giroux is the, the guy that you have to read and understand, and he's not fun to read, let me tell you. He's very 
Um, it's got a very peculiar writing style that it's not odd or difficult. It's just irritating. It, you can sense his kind of agitation. Um, there are a handful of others. Joe Kinchelo is another name, very important figure in critical pedagogy. Ira Shore is another name of some significance. Um, Stanley Aronowitz uh, is another, and probably maybe Michael Apple, but he's pretty early. Uh, as far as these kind of older guard people go, there are more than that. I'm just going to leave it there. I'm still relatively new to reading the literature on critical pedagogy in any depth. Um, so I'm reading this book on critical pedagogy by Henry Giroux, and it sticks out to me like a sore thumb how often this guy says democracy, democratic, whatever, right? He's utterly obsessed. I mean, it appears to where so often he's rambling about how important critical pedagogy is to democracy. He's, he's saying it so many times so often that it just stands out when you read the book that this guy's obsessed with the idea of democracy. Well, this isn't my first time around the critical block, so I know when they say democracy, they mean something particular by it. And I'm going to kind of ease into that, uh, but let me just read just one paragraph. I think I actually did a search, and I don't think it searched the PDF correctly. I have a book on PDF, and it said that the democratic democracy, words of that kind. You know, I searched through the Democra uh, in in the find thing. It, it, it claims, and I think it's a lot of like metadata or something. It certainly claims hundreds of, it certainly appears hundreds of times, but it claims that it's 878 times that the term democracy appears in this book. I think it's probably more like two or 300. That's still a lot of times. And uh, like I said, it sticks out. And this isn't uncommon. I mean, Herbert Marcuse's One Dimensional Man mentions democracy 60 something times. Um, his essay on liberation mentions it 40 or 50 times. Repressive tolerance mentions it 40 or 50 times. I mean, this is a concept that they talk about a lot. And the critical pedagogists, the education theorists who've taken up critical theory, believe that if we don't educate our children with critical theory, if we don't make them critically conscious activists, then we're never going to have a true democracy. And that true democracy concept or ideal democracy sometimes becomes very important to understanding this double meaning to the word democracy, which is ultimately very nasty and is going to kind of like make you a little uncomfortable when you hear the Democratic Party say, you know, everything's a threat to our democracy. We have to preserve our democracy, yada, yada, yada. Um, I'm just kind of read this a little bit and then this one paragraph. But anyway, to give you some sense, you know, he says the major impetus of this book. So this is pretty close to the introduction, or it is part of the introduction. The major impetus of this book is to present the theoretical and practical elements of a critical pedagogy in which education has a responsibility not only uh, to search for the truth regardless of where it may lead. <laughs> yeah, right. But also to educate students to make authority politically and morally accountable. Such an approach is informed by the assumption that public and higher education must strive to expand the pedagogical con uh, conditions necessary to sustain those modes of critical agency, dialogue, and social responsibility crucial to keeping democracies alive. Critical pedagogy within schools and the critical public pedagogy produced in, bro in broader cultural apparatuses are modes of intervention dedicated to creating those democratic public spheres where individuals can think critically, relate sympathetically to the problems of others, and intervene in the world in order to address major social problems. So you get immediately the idea here that this guy thinks that whatever democracy is about, critical pedagogy is underneath this at a very fundamental level. And, you know, something to do with holding power accountable, etc. Um, he even says, uh, and this isn't necessarily just all of the part I want to read, but he even says, um, although questions regarding whether educational institutions should serve strictly public rather than private interests no longer carry the weight of forceful criticism as they did in the past, such questions are still crucial in addressing the reality of public and higher education and what it might mean to imagine the full participation of such institutions in public life as protectors and promoters of democratic values, especially at a time when the meaning and purpose of public and higher education are besieged 
by a phalanx of narrow economic and political interests. Okay, so his positioning here is basically that the democratic society is on, in this book is under assault by the forces of neoliberalism, which is a kind of very strict market fundamentalism is how he characterizes it, to believe that the market can solve all problems, etc. And so a critical pedagogy is going to be necessary to save democracy and to save education um, so that we can have a fully democratic society where we can imagine the full participation of such institutions in public life uh, as protectors and promoters of democratic values. So democratic, democratic. And this is, then he goes on to say, all of the chapters in this book share the position that public and higher education may constitute one of the few public spheres left in which critical knowledge, values, and learning offer a glimpse of the promise of education for nurturing hope and a substantive democracy. So again, the word democracy is popping up and it's in conjunction with critical. We have to have critical knowledge, values, and learning because that gives us a glimpse of the promise of education for nurturing hope and a substantive democracy. It may be the case that everyday life is increasingly organized around market principles, but confusing democracy with market relations hollows out the legacy of education, which is inherently moral, not commercial. So he wants to have our education be inherently oriented around mor morality, not being able to participate in the economy that's going to be the lifeblood of people being able to actually thrive, survive, etc. in the society that we have. He instead wants a moral education that's rooted in those critical, that critical knowledge, values, and learning. And that, he says, is crucial to a democracy. You know, you, when you have a real democracy, it's more concerned about the values that people hold, which he means critical values, and not the, the market interests or whatever, which, you know, this is a kind of confusion at the heart of critical pedagogy, but I don't want to belabor it because this is a podcast about the manipulations of the word democracy. So he goes on, democracy places civic demands upon its citizens, and such demands point to the necessity of an education that is broad-based, critical, and supportive of meaning, citizen, meaningful citizen power, participation in self-governments, and democratic leadership. So this is a sentence that's easy to agree with, but you have to raise the question mark. Critical. Which way does he mean that? Right? I mean, generally, I would agree that democracy places civic demands on its citizens, and I think most of us would agree. And in fact, that's part of the problem that we face right now is that people have let that erode. In fact, it has been deliberately eroded by the anti-values and anti-virtues of critical theory and critical pedagogy. Uh, so, but we would agree on this. And then such demands, he says, point to the necessity of an education that is broad-based. Yeah, I think that's right. Critical. Well, what do you mean by that? And there's the problem. And supportive of meaningful citizen power. Well, do you mean activism? What do you mean by that? Participation in self-governance. I thought you were against a libertarian thing here. And democratic leadership. Well, we have a republic, so that's a complicated question. It's technically a democratic republic. But he goes on to say, only through such a critical educational culture. So now we're getting pretty clear on what he means by critical. He doesn't mean critical thinking. He means critical theory. Only through such a critical educational culture can students learn how to become individual and social agents rather than merely disengaged spectators and become able not only to think otherwise, but also to act upon civic commitments that, quote, necessitate a reordering of basic power arrangements fundamental to promoting the common good and producing a meaningful democracy. So now power arrangements are being brought in. So here we have this architect of critical pedagogy, the father of critical pedagogy, Henry Giroux, waxing at length. Again, he mentions democracy so much that it sticks out. Like, could this guy shut up about democracy, democracy, democracy? He's obsessed with democracy. And he says that critical values are necessary for it. It's clear he means critical theory. And then he gets to the point at the end to necessitate a reordering of basic power arrangements fundamental to the promotion, promoting the common good, you know, probably some kind of collectivist nonsense uh, under his view, and producing a meaningful democracy. So now we have this idea that a regular democracy needs to be qualified as a meaningful democracy. And we see this again when we read, for example, in Herbert Marcuse, who 
by the way, Jeru cites over and over and over again in this book. I mean, let's see how many times, actually, I didn't think to do this. So this is Marcuse. So he cites Marcuse, it looks like, 26 times in this book. So Marcuse is no stranger to uncritical pedagogy or to, um, to Henry Giroux's thought. So what does Marcuse say about democracy? Well, we've read, we've read repressive tolerance before. We know it's a horrific, um, a horrific essay. I'm not going to belabor the point by rereading the whole thing. I'm just going to read this very short section, not even a whole paragraph. Um, I'm reading his essay on liberation right now for another series here on the podcast, and we're we're going to see he mentions democracy there a lot. We're going to turn to that in a minute, uh, but here's what he has to say. So this is just somewhere down pretty deep in the middle of the essay. Uh, Herbert Marcuse, this is in his 1965 essay, Repressive Tolerance, writes, at the outset, I propose that the question cannot be answered in terms of the alternative between democracy and dictatorship according to which, in the latter, one individual or group, without any effective control from below, arrogate themselves to the decision. Historically, even in the most democratic democracies, the vital and final decisions affecting the society as a whole have been made constitutionally or in fact by one or several groups without effective control by the people themselves. The ironical question, who educates the educators, that is, the political leaders, also applies to a democracy. The only authentic alternative and negation, notice the Hegelian language, the only authentic alternative and negation of dictatorship with respect to this question would be a society in which the people have become autonomous individuals freed from the repressive requirements of a struggle for existence in the interest of domination, and as such human beings choosing their government and determining their life. Such a success, so you think, oh yeah, well, that's like America, right? No, he says such a success society, such a society does not yet exist anywhere. And so, Herbert Marcuse, Herbert Marcuse is saying that whatever is meant by democracy is not what we have in countries like the United States. What he's saying, in fact, is that. Even in the most democratic democracies, the vital and final decisions affecting the society as a whole have been made constitutionally or in fact by one or several groups without effective control by the people themselves. So when you read his One Dimensional Man or you read uh, this essay in particular or, uh, as well, or you read his essay on liberation where he rails again and again and again on the heteronymous interests outside the individual who are making the decisions for you, the, the powers that be, the consumerist uh, culture setters, the consumerist capitalists who are, are advertising to you and propagandizing to you constantly, the powers of the government that are propagandizing the media, etc. This is these people are constantly propagandizing to you and they're making you think things that aren't what you really think. They're making you think and act and vote so far as democracy democracy is concerned, not in your best interest. And if you had a critical consciousness, that would be different. That's really his whole kind of argument, right? The only authentic alternative and negation of dictatorship. So he's looking for an a, a, a dialectical negation of dictatorship. And he's saying the democracies that we have right now aren't it. That would be a society in which the people have become autonomous individuals. And I don't think he's talking about populism. I think he's talking about people's movements, aka communism. Because it's the people freed from the repressive requirements of a struggle for existence and the interest of domination. Only then would such human beings be choosing their government and determining their life. So he's actually saying or implying that a we have very democratic democracies apparently in the world, but they're not genuinely democratic. Whatever this democracy is that Drew is so worked up about, reaching back a couple of decades to Herbert Marcuse, looks like it's something that has to be where all of the people are freed from the repressive requirements of a struggle for existence, presumably in a capitalist society, that's held up in the interest of domination. 
And he says, again, such a society does not yet exist anywhere. In the meantime, the question, he says, must be treated in abstracto, abstraction, not from the historical possibilities, but from the realities of the prevailing society. So this is extremely Hegelian for those of you who are keeping score. By the way, he's talking about this being an abstracto. Remember that Hegel's dialectic is the abstract, hits its negation, and from that you can get to the concrete. And so for them, the concrete is the concrete realization of an ideal democracy under a utopian liberal socialism or communism. And so he's got this language everywhere, the negation, blah, 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 the abstraction, blah, 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 that this is a very Hegelian document. And the idea is that if we challenge, if, if we assume that the democracies that we have now are not genuinely democratic for some reason or another, that we can then hit them with their negation and then we'll be able to move toward some society where the people have become autonomous individuals freed from the repressive requirements of a struggle for existence in the interest of domination. And that's the only authentic, authentic alternative in negation of dictatorship. Everything else is not a full negation of dictatorship. Everything else is partially a dictatorship. So this is what Marcuse is talking about when he says democracy. And then you're starting to get this sniff test like this sounds like communist propaganda. Yeah. And so at the end of this essay, which he originally wrote in 1965, this being repressive tolerance, if you've lost track, he has a footnote or a, a afterword that he wrote in 1968 or 9. I'd have to look up again to see what it is. The very bot 869, I think he wrote this. So at the very bottom of this footnote or this afterword that he's written, reflecting upon, I guess it's an afterword, not a footnote, reflecting upon his repressive tolerance four years later. The last paragraph, the last paragraph dives into this exact same kind of thing. He says, however, the established, oh, sorry, however, the alternative to the established semi-democratic process. So remember, the de most democratic democracies in the world are not an authentic negation or alternative to dictatorship. They're in fact reproducing dictatorship in a different form. That's what Marcuse's uh, assumption. So the United States with its constitution is producing a dictatorship of the constitution and the people that it empowers and, uh, and favors or the people who win under its constitutional system. And so this is a semi-democracy, not a full democracy, a semi-democratic system. So he says the alternative to this established semi-democratic process is not a dictatorship or elite, no matter how intellectual and intelligent, but a struggle for real democracy. Okay, so he's reacting, of course, to the fact that communism everywhere it gets tried, or socialism everywhere it gets tried, turns into a complete catastrophe. A dictatorship by a elite, a bourgeois vanguard that's supposed to usher in uh, the revolution that the idiot proletariat is never going to figure out for itself, or that uh, isn't going to get engaged in because they're too fat, dumb, and happy because capitalist society gives them a life worth living. And, you know, that's terrible for, for revolutionaries. So he's reacting to that here. So what he says, though, is that we have to have a struggle for real democracy. So all of the other democracies, the most democratic of democracies in the world, are semi-democratic. And what we need is a struggle for real democracy. Part of the struggle, he says, is the fight against an ideology of tolerance, which is totally insane, which in reality favors and fortifies the conservation of the status quo of inequality and, and discrimination. So for the struggle, I propose the practice of discriminating tolerance. To be sure, this practice already presupposes the radical goal which it seeks to achieve. And so we've read this before. We've covered this issue before here on the podcast. If you haven't heard it, you should go check that out. I did a four-part podcast series on repressive tolerance. So you can listen to that. It's like five hours long. It's worth it. Um, here we have this idea, though, that uh, the existing dem most democratic democracies are set up so that they utilize tools like tolerance as being repressive tolerance, a critique of pure tolerance as a larger book in which this appears. And um, he says that that favors and fortifies the conservation of the status quo of inequality and discrimination. So the existence of inequality and discrimination is what sets apart a semi-democracy from a real democracy. So we're starting to get some clues about what these people mean by democracy. And it's looking more and more like it's a situation in which the people 
are all made equal somehow, and until everybody's made equal, everything, everything is not truly democratic, because instead, it tolerates inequalities, it tolerates maybe discrimination, which isn't really true in our society, but they like to pretend it is. And that conserves the status quo and is therefore conservative and not democratic. In fact, he refers to it as anti-democratic and semi-democratic. So then we turn our attention to his his essay in 1969 uh, on liberation, and he's talking about this semi-democratic thing quite a lot. Actually, the term democracy or democrat or democratic or whatever appears over 50 times, 52 times it says, according to my word search, my keyword search in this essay. So he's talking a lot about this democracy again. He's railing on the semi-democracy of the U.S. And just to read parts of two and a half paragraphs or so, he says the semi-democratic process works of necessity against radical change because it produces and sustains a popular majority whose opinion is generated by the dominant interests in the status quo. So this is huge. This sentence is actually hugely important to understanding what these neo-Marxists mean by democracy. They first of all identify it as a semi-democratic process, and they say that it works of necessity against radical change. So a real democracy would not work against radical change. In fact, it would favor radical change. Because a semi-democracy, which is working of necessity against radical change, does so because, he says, it produces and sustains a popular majority who must have more power and opportunity and resources, whose opinion is generated by the dominant interest in the status quo. As long as this condition prevails, Marcuse notes, it makes sense to say that the general will is always wrong. Wrong inasmuch as it objectively counteracts the possible transformation of society into more humane ways of life. Of course, this whole essay is about liberation, and the liberation he's describing is a liberation from capitalist society and oppressive society in toto. What he's describing is, in fact, a liberated socialism. A socialism without the bureaucracies, without going the wrong road that Lenin and Stalin did. And he's at this point in 1969 thinking Mao's got it right. He says in this essay that China, the Chinese revolution is going great. So he doesn't know yet that Mao is actually killing people by the millions, uh, even while he's writing this and he's praising him because it turns out communism doesn't know how. Maybe I've said that before. Uh, so he goes on to say, to be sure, oh, sorry, let's hold up. It objectively counteracts the possible transformation of society into more humane ways of life, which of course he means something like communism. This liberated socialism is going to be the communism that doesn't take the wrong turn of Stalin that he envisions uh, in this kind of batshit essay that he's written here. So to be sure, he writes, the method of persuasion is still open to the minority, but it is fatally reduced by the fact that the leftist minority does not possess the large funds, oh boohoo, you don't have enough money, for equal access to the mass media, which speak day and night for the dominant interests, with those whose wholesome Sorry, with those wholesome interludes in favor of the opposition that buttress the illusory faith in prevailing equality and fair play. And yet, without the continuous effort of persuasion of reducing one by one the hostile majority, the prospects of the opposition would be still darker than they are. So he's saying, we, the radical left, the new left that I've created, don't have equal access to the soapbox. So we don't have a real democracy. If everybody doesn't have equal access to the soapbox, or in particular, if radical leftists don't have equal access to the soapbox, if these activists don't have favored or equal, at least, access to the soapbox, we don't have a real democracy. We only have one that maintains the status quo. And if we look back on repressive tolerance where he's like the the status quo or the right, the conservatives already have entrenched power. So we need to be given more power. We need to censor the right. We need to pre-censor the right so they can't even form their own thoughts. We need to be given as the left more power and access. This is what it's looking like it takes to achieve a real democracy under these people's ideas. And so more Marcuse, he has a the next paragraph begins with a clause with a colon dialectics of democracy for those of you that are keeping up with the hegelian nature of what's going on in this leftist faith and he says this is what the dialectics of democracy are if democracy means self-government of free people with justice for all 
And so you see where this is going, don't you? Free people with justice for all. You see where this is going. Then the realization of democracy would presuppose abolition of the existing pseudo-democracy. So our existing society has to be, uh, our existing democratic republic has to be destroyed, has to be abolished in order to get to true justice, sorry, to, to true democracy, which will have justice for all, where guess who's defining justice? One of these weasel words that means two things at once, just like we saw with critical a moment ago. He says, in the dynamic of corporate capitalism, the fight for democracy thus tends to assume anti-democratic forms, and to the extent to which the democratic decisions are made in parliaments on all levels, the opposition will tend to become extra-parliamentary. The movement to extend constitutionally professed rights and liberties to the daily life of the oppressed minorities, and even the movement to preserve existing rights and liberties, will become subversive to the degree to which it will meet the stiffening resistance of the majority against an exaggerated interpretation and application of equality and justice. So now we know that until whatever justice means, according to these guys' calculations, is met, and we have that for all equally, and we have what they deem as equality, which is going to be equality of outcome and access at the same time, we don't have a true democracy. And to get to a true democracy, the realization of a true democracy would presuppose abolition of the existing pseudo-democracy. And the problem, of course, is corporate capitalism. That's what he's arguing. An opposition which is derived, he says, not against a particular form of government or against particular conditions within a society, but against a given social system as a whole cannot remain legal and lawful because it is established it is the established legality and the established law which it opposes. So he's saying that to get to our real democracy, we need to be Ill- we need to act illegally. We have to be unlawful so that we can abolish the existing pseudo-democracy and get to our real democracy where there's justice for all and perfect equality communism. The fact that the democratic process provides for the redress of grievances and for legal and lawful changes does not alter the illegality inherent in an opposition to an institutionalized democracy which halts the process of change at the stage where it would destroy the existing system. By virtue of this built-in stabilizer or governor, capitalist mass democracy is perhaps to a higher degree self-perpetuating than any other form of government or society. This is a brilliant little piece here. And the more the more so, the more it rests not on terror and scarcity, but on efficiency and wealth, and on the majority will of the underlying and administered population. So his claim here is that if people are happy and people are not facing terror or scarcity, but they have efficiency and wealth and comfort generally, that they are actually an administered population. And the administered population is serving the dominant interests in society, and as such, they don't have genuine democracy. This could be with totally, perfectly legitimate elections, etc. We're not getting into the whole nightmare of the current moment. He's saying that the most democratic of democratic societies are not truly democratic. They're pseudo-democratic, and the reason is because they are not liberated. In other words, they have not achieved liberated socialism. In other words, because they are not communist. So this is what's really going on here. This is what's really going on here. And so I'm going to read one more excerpt that makes this really kind of explicit, and then I'm going to get, I'm going to cut right to that chase um, to kind of show you that this is we can we will understand what democracy means after this so here this is from a book that's not particularly this gigantic famous book this is a handbook of critical race theory in education so this is a book that um is surprisingly uh, radical given that it is just supposed to be a handbook of critical race theory in education you think it'd be pretty straightforward it's pretty horrifying so here's this little passage um Education, liberation, and leadership are not the exclusive domain of the ruling race, gender, and or class. They are vital human needs, just as food, clothing, and shelter are human necessities. But without critical education and authentic liberation, I'm sorry, authentic liberation thought that speaks to the specificities of continental and diaspora, am I saying that right? Diaspora and 
diasporan, di diasporan Africans, and other subjugated souls, life worlds, and life struggles, ongoing hardships and unspeakable hurts, long-held utopian hopes and deep-seated radical democratic desires, then all oppressed and racially colonized people have our abstract and empty inquiries into Eurocentric notions of justice, freedom, democracy, liberation, peace, and perhaps most importantly, what it means to be human. Capitalist, racial, colonialist, and or global imperialist, in scare quotes, democracy is a deformation of democracy that enables the ruling race, gender, and or class to put the premium on what the oppressed are fighting for and how they should fight for what they are fighting for. And so, skipping a little bit here, what I am calling for here is nothing short of a critical multiculturalist, revolutionary humanist, and radical democratic socialist transgression and transcendence of Eurocentric ideological, imperial, imperial education, socialization, and globalization. But this, let me just hit that one part again real quick. Capitalist, racial colonialist, and or global imperialist quote, democracy, is a deformation of democracy that enables the ruling race, gender, and or class to put the premium on what the oppressed are fighting for and how they should fight for what they are fighting for. And so what we have here then in this book, a handbook for critical race theory in education, is a pretty explicit explanation that we don't have real democracy because there are powered interests, ruling race, gender, and or class, they get to control how democracy goes. They have more opportunities, for example, um, that don't want to chase after this radical democratic socialist transgression and transcendence of Eurocentric ideological imperial education, socialization, and globalization, which is exactly what Marcuse was just talking about. Right? He said that that's where they put the limit in his essay on liberation. Uh, he says... Um, the, 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 the fact that the democratic, this is Marcuse again, the fact that the democratic process provides for the redress of grievances and for legal and lawful changes does not alter the illegality inherent in an opposition to an institutional democracy which halts the process of change at the stage where it would destroy the existing system. By virtue of this built-in stabilizer or governor, capitalist mass democracy is perhaps to a higher degree self-perpetuating than any other form of government or society. It's not radically democratic socialist transgression. It doesn't permit that. It permits you to go right up to the line. You can be as you can ask for a redress of your grievance. You, you can petition the government. You can do all kinds of activism. You can say whatever you want, but it won't let you throw out the system itself. And therefore, it is somehow a bigger problem than any other form of government or society, and that's mostly because it produces things that people actually want rather than the stupid socialist revolution. So now you're starting to hopefully get the impression that I want to give, which is that the dual meaning of democracy is the usual thing, which isn't even what the United States is based on. We're a republic that utilizes democracy. But at the same time, that they don't believe there's a true democracy unless communism is there as a presupposition. That communism is a precondition or a democracy isn't true. So therefore, while democracy as a double meaning word in this uh, language game of these neo-Marxists doesn't technically mean communism, it implies communism because it's not a true democracy until it's a communist democracy. So we turn to one of my favorite sources, and this is the last thing I'll read, then I'll comment a little bit and we'll go home. The entry in the Marxist glossary, I always, I keep telling you, Marxist.org has a wonderful glossary. They've written a copious amount of what they actually mean by stuff. And this is Marxism, so it's not quite the same as postmodernism or neo-Marxism or woke, but it's, the roots are the same, the family tree is the same, it's all similar. And so what do they write about democracy? What is, what is the Marxist.org glossary of terms democracy entry say? Well, let's read it. Democracy, a political system of rule by the majority. Okay, that's a fair definition. Democracy is a much abused term, however, with even the most stunted, abstract, and limited forms of suffrage going by the name of democracy. And then they quote from Lenin, State and Revolution. 
And I quote, Lenin is who they appeal to. In capitalist society, this is Lenin, we have a democracy that is curtailed, wretched, false. A democracy only for the rich, for the minority. The dictatorship of the proletariat, the period of transition to communism, will for the first time create democracy for the people, for the majority, along with the necessary suppression of the exploiters of the minority. That's the rich people, by the way. That's the people who have political power. Communism alone is capable of providing really complete democracy. And the more complete it is, the sooner it will become unnecessary and wither away of its own accord. So if you don't remember in my Hegel podcast, first of all, this, this is Lenin. Communism alone is capable of providing, a, providing really complete democracy. And if you don't remember from my Hegel, I said that the idea with Hegel is that the ideas slowly perfect over time due to encountering their own contradictions through the dialectical process. Alf Haben goes, the dialectical the dialectic uh, progresses, and eventually the absolute realizes itself. The eschaton immunitizes, and a utopia where the perfected ideas ruling over society begins at the end of history. And that Marx took this and said, well, you know, you have all these different economic forms, feudalism, mercantilism capitalism, and eventually that gives way to this socialism, the dictatorship of the proletariat, the period of transition to communism. That's how Lenin names this, and that will for the first time create democracy for the people, for the majority, along with the necessary suppression of the exploiters of the minority. And then Marx says the dialectical process will continue on this administered dictatorship of the proletariat because it will be led by the proletariat and the contradictions will slowly work themselves out. The theory will be in place and bada bing, bada boom. Communism will emerge. And when communism emerges, we've achieved the end of history because all of the contradictions in class society will have been worked out because everybody will be truly equal. And Lenin says communism alone is capable of producing really complete democracy. And the more complete it is, the sooner it will become unnecessary and wither away of its own accord. Continuing with Lenin, democracy for an insignificant minority, democracy for the rich, that is the, the democracy of capitalist society. If we look more closely into the machinery of capitalist democracy, we see everywhere in the petty, supposedly petty details of the suffrage, residential qualifications, exclusion of women, and so on, and the technique of the representative institutions and the actual obstacles to the right of assembly, public buildings are not for paupers, in the purely capitalist organization of the daily press, etc., etc., we see restriction after restriction upon democracy. These restrictions, exceptions, exclusions, obstacles for the poor seem slight, especially in the eyes of one who has never known want himself, and has never been in close contact with the oppressed classes in their mass life, and nine out of ten, if not ninety-nine out of a hundred bourgeois publicists and politicians come under this category. But in their sum total, these restrictions exclude and squeeze out the poor from politics, from active participation in democracy. This is again Lenin, State and Revolution, Chapter 5, as quoted in the Marxist.org glossary entry for democracy. Democracy for an insignificant minority, democracy for the rich, that is a demo the democracy of capitalist society. And there's some total these restrictions exclude and squeeze out the poor from politics, from active participation in democracy. So communism then, as he says, alone is capable of providing really complete democracy. And this is how these people think about democracy. The poor can't fully participate. The poor don't have as much voice as the rich. The poor can't access as many public spaces. The poor don't get the voice represented in the media. The poor, the poor, the poor. Of course, this is Leninism. This is straight Marxist Leninism that is fully interested only in class struggle. It's not looking at racial, etc. But when we get to Marcuse a few decades later, we are seeing the introduction of other dimensions of oppression other than just class oppression. And what he's saying is so long as there's any difference in your access, this is Lenin, we don't have true democracy. Communism alone, where there is no difference in access whatsoever, is capable of providing really complete democracy. 
So we go back, what do the, the Marxist.org people say about this? Communism means in the first place a step far above the limited democracy found under capitalism. This is their explanation of what Lenin wrote. By the most thoroughgoing proletarian democracy, and after that, the withering away of democracy as the majority less and less finds it necessary to overrule the will of any minority because the majority is neither threatened nor damaged by the minority. In other words, without classes, conflict will be on a personal level, not on a social level. That's what communism is supposed to look like, and then we'll have true democracy. Any conflict that's left will not be between social groups or classes. It will not be due to hierarchy. It will be one individual to another because they're individuals. And that's where true democracy can finally take place under communism. But then it becomes even unnecessary because you don't need to overrule any the majority never needs to overrule a minority. You never have to have a vote where the majority will is is put forth and the minority says, well, we have to accept it and maybe next time we get our, our turn in our election because we make the case better, we rally the troops better, or whatever it happens to be. That won't even happen under communism because the majority, they say, is neither threatened nor damaged by the minority. There's no hierarchy to society once you get to no classes. That's what they're saying. And then you have true democracy. In order to understand the breadth and strength of proletarian democracy, the working class must first recognize the limitations of bourgeois democracy. So now we see the Marxists separating proletarian democracy from bourgeois democracy. And the, the, the goal of raising a class consciousness includes the political agenda of getting the working class to awaken to being a proletariat in the first place by recognizing the limitations that the, of the bourgeois democracy that are exploiting them and that are oppressing them. And so now we are quoting from, they are, they are quoting from Marx, uh, chapter five of Civil War in France. Quote, while the, me <clears throat> while the merely repressive organs of the old governmental power were to be amputated, its legitimate functions were to be rest rested from an authority usurping preeminence over society itself and restored to the po responsible agents of society. Instead of deciding once every in three or six years which member of the ruling class was to misrepresent the people in parliament, universal, su universal suffrage was to serve the people. So we're not going to elect representatives because then that establishes a ruling class, even though those people are supposed to be subject to the will of the people. That's not going to be good enough. Generally speaking, this is the uh, comment. This is not Marx. And we're going to quote Marx again in a second. I think maybe this is Lenin, actually. Um, it might have been Lenin. That was a civil war in France, and I'm not quite sure, actually, who wrote that because it doesn't give a name. Let me check. Um, maybe it doesn't even say that here. Oh yeah, that, that was Marx. Okay, so this is going to be Lenin, State and Revolution, again, chapter 5. Uh, sorry if I hit the microphone and it made a noise. Generally speaking, though, they introduce this quote by saying, bourgeois democracy develops in proportion to the growing maturity and strength of the working class. Quote, in capitalist society, providing it develops, providing it develops under the most favorable conditions, we have a more or less complete democracy in the democratic republic, but this democracy is always hemmed in by the narrow limits set by capitalist exploitation, and consequently always remains in effect a democracy for the minority, only for the propertied classes, only for the rich. Freedom in capitalist society always remains about the same as it was in the ancient Greek republics, freedom for the slave owners. Owing to the conditions of capitalist exploitation, the modern wage slaves are so crushed by want and poverty that they cannot be bothered with democracy, cannot be bothered with politics. In the ordinary peaceful course of events, the majority of the population is debarred from participation in public and political life. Okay, so this is from chapter 5 of State and Revolution, uh, and that's Lenin being quoted there. Cheerful, charming guy. And so what you see here then is, again, this argument's being reiterated under communism that democracy is not real if it's not under communism. Democracy is not real if it's not under communism. When communism becomes fully true communism, you don't even need democracy anymore. That's their view. They, this is their crackpot religion they actually believe. 
So the Marxist.org people go on to say, it may appear that universal suffrage provides the opportunity for the working class to elect socialists to government and overthrow capitalism peacefully and constitutionally. The capitalist state would never allow this. Well, that's what Marcuse said, right? The repressive nature of bourgeois democracy becomes clear, however, only when the working class has outgrown bourgeois society and is ready to go beyond it. And so now we are quoting from, let me make sure who this is, from Origin of the Family, chapter 9. And this is, well, we're in chapter 9. I have to scroll up to see who it is. Uh, this is Engels. This is Frederick Engels. Um, Universal suffrage is thus the gauge of the maturity of the working class. It cannot and never will be anything more in the modern state, but that is enough. On the day when the thermometer of universal suffrage shows, shows boiling point among the workers, they as well as the capitalists will know where they stand. Then switching to the Communist Manifesto, the first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of of ruling class to win the battle of democracy. The proletariat will use its political supremacy to wrest by degree all capital from the bourgeoisie, to centralize all instruments of production in the hands of the state, that is, of the proletariat organized as the ruling class, and to increase the total productive forces as rapidly as possible. So this is the road that Lenin said is going to lead us to an actual improved democracy is to give the proletariat the ability to seize everything and control fully at the state level. And the Marxists go on to say Marx and Engels worked out how long Mar Marx and Engels that has an apostrophe worked out how the working class could transcend bourgeois democracy by observing the action of the Parisian workers in the Paris Commune of 1871. And this is from this is quoting Marx, he said, quote, the commune was formed of the municipal councillors chosen by universal suffrage in the various wards of the town, responsible and revocable at short terms. The majority of its members were naturally workers or acknowledged representatives of the working class. The commune was to be a working, not a parliamentary body, executive and legislative at the same time. So we're really saying here that parliamentary democracy is a problem. It's not going to work, that that's the wrong kind of democracy. And it has a ruling class. It's not of the people or for the people. It's not a true democracy, which is exactly the thing that Greeks were like, you don't want that, you really don't want that. And so anyway, the, the Marxists go on to write, that is to say proletarian democracy was not just representative democracy, but participatory democracy. Class society is founded upon the division of labor between mental and manual labor. Corresponding to this, the form of democracy which best suits the maintenance of class society is the separation of executive and legislative powers. That is, one class of people decides what should be done, while another class of people do it. In order to transcend class society, the working class must introduce a mode of life in which everywhere the people are doing something Sorry, the people doing something decide amongst themselves by consensus what and how it should be done. Okay, so this is getting really crazy because they're targeting the division of powers between executive and legislative branch. They say that a proletarian democracy, which is on our way to a true democracy under communism, is going to do away with the separation of powers between uh, between legislative and executive. That, well, that's a bad idea. Uh, that's a nightmare waiting to happen. And you kind of see how those things play out. And how are they going to decide? Who gets to decide? The people doing something. And then what, are they, who, what do they get to do? They get to decide amongst themselves by consensus what and how it should be done. And of course, decisions by consensus. This is what Jean-Francois Lyotard actually warned us about in the postmodern condition in 1979, where he said that he called, you know, the decisions by consensus, legitimation by parology, by fake logic. We're not worried about what's true. We're not trying to get to the bottom of it. We're going to have consensus, and then we're going to act. And this is where you start to get mob activity. Because mobs have consensus. They go on to say, workers get little opportunity to learn something about running the country or even their own workplace because that work is done by politicians, capitalists, and managers. Even politicians are kept in the dark and manipulated by the unelected people that run the businesses and government departments. Real power is in the boardrooms and the elite clubs for the rich. All positions of authority in socialist society must be elected solely by workers and subject to recall at any time. Well, 
this is the Marxist analysis. You can see how uh, when you start to have a situation like we're in today that you're like, mm, that seems a little bit on point. Um, where we do have boardrooms and elite clubs for the rich that actually can give sway over political parties. <laughs> but um, that's, a, that's the corruption of a democratic republic, isn't it? That's the thing that we want to try to minimize. And then that's when we can actually have a genuine uh, republic that, that's operating rather than, say, an oligopoly or a oligarchy. Um, oligarchy is the thing I was looking for. And so their view is that we have to somehow obliterate the idea of managers at all or the managed, and thus we have to obliterate parliaments. We have to blend the, the legislative and executive functions of the government into a single thing rather than separated powers. And they go on to write the separation of executive and legislative powers in bourgeois parliamentary democracy means that even if workers' representation gains a majority in parliament, they find that in reality they control nothing. And this is what it's all about. For, for true democracy, we have to have communism. That's their view. You have to have socialism because under socialism, all positions of authority must be elected solely by the workers who are designated the uh, anointed in that society and subject to recall at any time. So here, going back to origin of the family, which if I recall correctly, uh, that was Lenin. They quote, the highest form of the state, the democratic republic, which in our modern social conditions becomes more and more an unavoidable necessity and is the form of state in which alone the last decisive battle between proletariat and bourgeoisie can be fought out. The democratic republic no longer officially recognizes differences of property. Wealth here employs its power indirectly, but all the more surely. It does this in two ways, by plain corruption of officials, of which America is the classic example, and by an alliance between the government and the stock exchange, which is affected all the more easily the higher the state debt mounts and the more the joint stock companies concentrate in their hands not only transport but also production itself and themselves have their own center in the stock exchange. Furthermore, the Marxists write, the state, the police military organization built by the bourgeoisie for the sole purpose of protecting private property is not elected and cannot be legislated into something else. State and revolution, did we decide that that was Marx? That was Marx. Democracy means equality. Maybe that was Lenin, I don't remember. Uh, state and revolution is Lenin. Sorry. So we're reading from Lenin here. Democracy means equality. Again, democracy means equality. Let me just say that again. Democracy means equality. Only under communism can you have true democracy. The great significance of the proletariat's struggle for equality and equality as a slogan will be clear if we correctly interpret it as meaning the abolition of classes. But democracy only means only formal equality, and as soon as equality is achieved for all members of society in relation to ownership of the means of production, that is equality of labor and wages, or equity as we might have it now, humanity will inevitably be confronted with the question of advancing farther from formal equality to actual equality, that is, to the operation of the rule from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. And I think uh, my friend Obeyed said on Twitter, earlier today, at the time of this recording, uh, from each according to his privilege, to each according to his oppression, is the kind of updated version of that. Lenin says, democracy is a form of the state. It represents, on the one hand, the organized systematic use of force against persons, but on the other hand, it signifies the formal recognition of equality of citizens, the equal right of all to determine the structure of it and to administer the state. So that equal right of all is the catch here that they don't think that exists unless you have communism. This in turn results in the fact that at a certain stage in the development of democracy, it first welds together the class that wages a revolutionary struggle against capitalism, the proletariat, and enables it to crush, smash to atoms, wipe off the face of the earth, the bourgeois. Even the Republican bourgeois, the state machine, the standing army, the police and the bureaucracy, and to substitute for them a more democratic state machine, but a state machine nevertheless in the shape of armed workers who proceed to form a militia involving entire population. The entire population. But how did that work out under Lenin, really, right? How did that work out? So the proletariat smashes to atoms, wipes off the face of the earth, the bourgeois, 
the state machine, the standing army, the police, and the bureaucracy. Isn't that kind of what's happening right now in the U.S. too? How about that? And then substitute them for a more democratic state machine like CHAZ and CHOP. Like the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, one might suppose. But a state machine nevertheless. And now we're back to Lenin, right? How did Lenin's state machine and state police work? Anybody want to live under Lenin's state police because it's more democratic according to Lenin's definition of democracy? Back to the Marxists to wrap up this little piece in their, their glossary here. Thus, bourgeois democracy, which supports the interests of capitalists above all else, is a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. This is, of course, how Antifa thinks about pretty much everything in our society. Democracy and freedom goes only so far. And as soon as the majority people decide that the, that the majority rule should apply, not only in the parliament, but also in the workplace, the factories and offices, in the army, in the schools and universities, and suddenly the capitalist state machine will without fail raise its head and say, enough is enough, and restore by whatever it takes the rule of the minority of wealthy capitalists over the majority of workers. Having won the battle of democracy, the workers must now make a revolution. The dictatorship of the working class majority replaces the dictatorship of the minority of big capitalists. The unelected police military hierarchy of violence is dismantled to make way for a genuine, unqualified, proletarian democracy. Contrarywise, socialism in which majority rule applies everywhere, can only be a dictatorship of the proletariat which suppresses the right of the minority of capitalists to exploit workers. Don't worry, it only holds down the privileged. It only oppresses the privilege. It only suppresses the privilege. It only sends the privilege to gulags. It only shoots the privileged into mass graves. It only, only does that because it's protecting the majority against the right of the minority of capitalists or privileged to exploit the oppressed. That's, that's, that's socialism. That's the good news. The dictatorship of the proletariat simply means the most thoroughgoing democracy, where money and privilege are no longer able to lay down the law to the working class majority, and free associations of people work out their lives in collaboration. That's what the fucking communists think about democracy, is that you only have democracy under a perfecting socialism or under communism again in the words of lenin cheerful dude who's talking about his wonderful replacement of the police with his better democratic police communism alone is capable of providing really complete democracy that's what the woke mean by democracy what they mean by democracy has two meanings it has its regular meaning and it has the meaning that presupposes an equity state has been achieved in toto. You don't have true democracy under wokery until you have full equity and justice in every dimension, racial justice, gender justice, class justice, sexual justice, all the justices, disability justice, all the ju fat justice, all the justices. You have to have all the justices, all the equities, complete, perfect equity. And then and only then do you have true democracy. So when they use the word democracy, if they're woke, they simultaneously can mean both what we actually mean by democracy, which they want in an unlimited fashion anyway, which isn't even a good idea, or a republic for a good reason that obviously Lenin and Marx don't like, but they also simultaneously mean that they are implying that the state is already perfectly equitable. So when they say that they're trying to defend democracy or that they want to work in terms of democracy, their definition of democracy can appeal to a broad group of people who understand it in the usual way, while they can change on a dime to mean that we don't actually have one until we have the full extent of what they call equity and the full extent of what they call justice. And remember, for example, the absolute moment that Derek Chauvin was found guilty of three counts of crimes in a ridiculous circumstance against George Floyd for his death. Within minutes, you had major Democratic politicians coming out saying 
This wasn't justice. This was merely accountability. Justice is something bigger. Justice requires a full remaking of our society. So until we fully made remade our society, till we fully have something that looks like whatever their ethno-communism or ethno-Marxism or identity Marxism or whatever we want to call it is, till we have identity communism and regular communism mixed in at the global level, because they also talk frequently, I didn't read any quotes from this about global democracy, until we have that, we don't have true democracy. And therefore, we have to keep working for that. And so when they say, when, when I hear the Democratic politicians who have gone woke, especially the ones whose handlers know because they're friggin' Marxists, say we have to defend democracy, the enemies of democracy, blah, blah, blah. I just replaced the word democracy nine times out of ten with whatever they said with communism, and it shockingly makes more sense because their democracy presupposes communism. You don't have, and I mean perfect equity across all the axes of neo-Marxist oppression, total liberated, blah, 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 communism, because you don't have democracy until then. Because for, and this is, this is how it works. I know I've organized this backwards and I finally get to the point at the end. This is how it works. If I have a single greater amount of resources than you, whether that's physical capital, like material capital, like money or property, whether I have a bigger following count on Twitter, maybe I'm better looking. Of course I am. Maybe uh, I have more privilege. If I have any advantage over you whatsoever, so says the handicapper general, if I have any advantage over you whatsoever, you and I are not perfectly equal. And therefore, our voice and our vote are not perfectly equal and we do not have true democracy. If I have any privilege over anybody else whatsoever, or you have any privilege over anybody else whatsoever, there is not true democracy. So for them, true democracy presupposes perfected equity. It presupposes communism. And so when I hear woke people talk about democracy, not only do I think that they want a completely wide open democratic system that's basically mob rule because they think they control the mob and for the moment in many respects well I don't, I don't know until recently they did and now they just control the institutions and don't really control i don't think a majority but they'll cook those books because they control the institutions won't they um given that you know when i hear them say anything about democracy I catch for a minute because I know that word means just like, I mean, just like critical. And that word means two things, just like critical, just like knowledge, just like every other word you could possibly imagine diversity, equity, inclusion, all these words that mean multiple things, maybe not equity, equity just means one thing, diversity and inclusion, certainly racism, all these words that mean two things. And here we have democracy and democracy means two things. And the one that the woke depend on believes that democracy isn't real democracy until it's fully and is it taking place in a fully equitable society that's under their control which means democracy isn't democracy until they have totalitarian control of society and so i shiver a little bit and i can't listen to a democratic politician talk about protecting, you know, they say we're going to, I don't know, put up like a bunch of military fences around the, uh, the capital or something so that we can protect democracy. And I'm like, uh, what? Okay. That's what's going on. I, I got you read you loud and clear. Um, so I get very nervous around their uses of the word democracy. I think that you should understand that when that they appeal to democracy, they mean two things. And one of those things presupposes communism. So communism is baked into their definition of or perfect equity, communism, whatever the hell equity communism works out to be is baked into their assumption of democracy. And so you have to be really careful. This is what these abuses of language enable. This is why Joseph Piper wrote abuse of language, abuse of power, um, because with their manipulating language, and a lot of people don't understand that they're manipulating the word democracy, which in a republic we should already be suspicious of, cautious around. Our constitution demands divided powers for a reason, a very good reason, a very good set of reasons. And when you hear about democratic notions, like we're going to have a completely unaccountable uh, Department of Anti-Racism, that's Kennedy's idea with constitutional amendment backing it up, that's got power over all three branches of government, though well, that's what they're talking about. 
perfect equity and the proletarian democracy that his department is going to usher in. And really, it's already kind of there. If you look under like environmental justice uh, requirements, and if you look under these new equity requirements that Biden's administration is baking in, we already really have Kendi's horrific uh, Department of Equity or whatever the hell, Department of Anti-Racism that he wants. Um, although it's really of equity and uh, across all of the dimensions. And when they say democracy, that's what they actually are talking about. It's totalitarian control under until we get to a system that is communism, at which point we don't really need it anymore. Yay. And so think twice when you hear them talk about democracy. Understand what at least the neo-Marxists, I can't speak for the entire Democratic Party, at least the Marxists and neo-Marxists mean by the word democracy and realize that it's um, yet another one of those linguistic manipulations that's got a pretty ugly dark side to it.